Welcome back friends. In previous video discussion we have talked about uh, RNA splicing, the basics of RNA splicing and what is RNA splicing. Now in this particular video we'll be discussing about uh, one of uh, the special mechanism of RNA splicing. It is called the self splicing or intron mediated splicing. Remember in previous discussion we have talked that uh, there are two different type of splicing. One is intron mediated, another one is the spliceosome mediated. Now in this particular video we'll be talking about the intron mediated splicing or self splicing. Now <clears throat> so it is about self splicing. Now why we are calling it a self splicing as the name suggests for this splicing to occur uh, we don't need a uh, spliceosome to form all the informations we need for the splicing of pre-mRNA resides in pre-mRNA especially the resides in the introns of the pre-mRNA. Now if you know about uh, the introns and exon ratio about the eukaryotic system for example uh, for us human being you can find that there are a lot more introns present in our body than the exons. So it seems most of the time that how is it possible that there are a lot of proteins that are being made and the coding regions that are retained is so small uh, and most of the part are introns. That means those regions which does not code for anything, does not code for any protein. So sometimes they are also called junk elements. Now what these junk elements are doing? Now if you think one uh, example or, or one advantageous effect that these junk uh, materials are doing here is this cell splicing. In case of the cell splicing, we are going to see that uh, this traditionally called the junk DNA or junk elements that are being present. These introns are carrying the signals in turn which are telling this mRNA to be spliced from which region to which region. Okay, so that's why we need to learn it. And uh, for this splicing, uh, let us consider. Uh, let us uh, first look at uh, the pro properties of this type of splicing. So this uh, self splicing, first of all, it uh, mostly, mostly not require any spliceosome or any uh, RNP. Generally, they won't require this RNPs or ribonucleoproteins. But sometimes they need small protein molecules to mask the negative charge of RNAs. Because what we are going to see in case of the self splicing event is simply the interaction between RNAs. So it's an RNA RNA interaction. As the RNA backbone is made up with phosphates, it is negatively charged. So there is a probable tendency of repelling each other. That's why we need sometimes the presence of small protein molecules to mask the negatively charged phosphate backbone of RNA. Now, second thing, this is uh, whether we can call it self catalytic or not. So let me write it here. Self catalytic self catalytic can we call them self catalytic reactions or not we are going to see it now for this cell splicing to occur it must contain a signal right because for any kind of uh, physiological or biological or cellular activities that are going on inside the cell must have access to a signal that is telling it to be happened now in case of cell self splicing also as the splicing is uh, occurred in the mRNAs this pre mRNAs are consisting of two different regions so let me draw the structure two regions for that one one is introns another one is exons so the exon regions so say say this and say this Say these two regions are exon regions, these blue color regions, and in between I am drawing this red color regions. This is intron region. Okay, so this is intron uh, red region, and these are the exons. So introns and these are exons. Now among the exon, let us consider this is the five prime, this is the three prime of this. RNA molecule. So this is a pre-mRNA molecule. Remember, 
So the mRNA which is not yet been processed is called the pre mRNA molecule. Now here among this intron exon there are nucleotides right because the whole sequence is made up with nucleotides. Now nucleotide arrangement is very important. So the sequences that are present is very very much important uh, for the self splicing to occur. Now what kind of uh, signals that we can have in both the cases we are having signals like so let me take black color here so signals like a g and g u so say both the case we are having a g g u and also a g g u like that so this is a signal this nucleotide signal present in this uh, terminal regions of intron exons. So the terminal barriers or the intervals of introns and exons, there is a AGGU sequence present. Now AG in this case present here at the 3 prime of the intron, GU starts from the 5 prime end of exons. Okay, so remember, now what happens, this AGGU sequence determines from where the cleavage must start from where the splicing must have done. So here in this case, as we are seeing uh, there is a AGG between this place, always, so this is uh, something which is a rule inside the cell, always splicing will start between AG and GU, so between this GG, so there are two G consecutive Gs, always splicing must occur in between this region, between uh, the two G's that are present covered by A and U both the sides. Okay, so most of the time uh, this thing happens. Okay, so here you can see so this A G present in this exon. So let it let we, let us mark them. So this is exon one, this is exon two, and this is only intron one. Now in exon uh, one we are having A and G. In introns we are having G U here. And at the end in intron we are having A G, and in E two at the beginning we are having G U. Clear, right? Now, not only these sequences are important for the splicing, there is another important sequence which is required for the splicing. And this is present at the middle of the intron. Not exactly the middle of the intron, but somewhere middle in the intron. Okay, and the sequence is called branch point. Now, why it is called the branch point? Because the sequence that is present somewhere middle in the intron will start the splicing for self splicing events so we call them as branch point so somewhere say, say at this region we are having a particular sequence most of the time the sequence is an A now we call it a branch point call it a branch point because from this point splicing begins so there are three different regions that are important for, uh, the, that are present in mRNA, which is also important for the mRNA splicing. The three sites are uh, this five prime initiators, five prime initiator sequence, or five prime splicing sequence, three prime splicing sequence, and the branch point. These three things are very, 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 very important. So this is uh, the, so this is called. So this is the one which is called a 5 prime splicing sequence, this is called the 3 prime splicing sequence and this is the third one which is called the branch point for self splicing. Now why it is called a self splicing, remember because it won't require the presence of the formation of spliceosome for the splicing to occur. So it can splice itself on its own using some of the proteins because sometimes Remember, I've talked that they need to shield the negatively charged regions. That's why they will need this. But otherwise, most of the time, they won't require those RNPs. So, remember, mostly they won't require this RNPs. Sometimes they require proteins. Now, the second part, as we are telling, they are self-splicing events. So, if we think this reaction as a catalytic reaction, can we call them catalyst? Let us uh, learn it. Further. So we have identified three different regions which are important for the self mRNA splicing. Now, how the system actually occurs? Now let us come to the machinery of RNA splicing. 
and how this RNA splicing actually happens. Okay. Okay, so so we have seen that uh, this branch point is also important. Now another important thing about the splicing and about the sequences, I must tell you, is uh, which is present just before this uh, this AGGU sequence and inside the intron sequence. Inside the introns, just before this A of this AGGU sequence, there is a repetitive pyrimidine sequences. So I can uh, write it like Y, 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 Y. So this is a repetitive pyrimidine sequence. Now this sequence is also very, very significant. So this pyrimidine repeat is also very, very significant. And in this branch point, there are other sequences like R, and Y. Y denotes pyrimidine, R denotes purine. Okay, so R denotes purine, Y denotes py pyrimidine. Now, here polypyrimidine residues just before this A of 3' prime splicing signal is a very, very important site. Why? This kind of signals telling other factors to come and bind with this region of the intron. So, I have to told you that. Proteins may not require, this typical ribonucleo proteins may not require in case of cell splicing, just uh, like, uh, unlike uh, the, the case of uh, the cell splicing, home mediated splicing. But for this type of spl splicing to occur, the signals are crucial. The signals are the most crucial part. So here this, this signal helps the binding of proteins, factors. Now these factors are uh, called the splicing enhancers. Okay, so the small proteins, so lot of small proteins come together and sit onto this polypyrimidine uh, residues, bind with themselves. They form a ribonucleo complex here. Now these proteins are called splices, splicing enhancers. Okay, now these enhancers will help to recruit, uh, to, to actually improvise the, the splicing event that are going on in this cell splicing process. Okay, so this is an important part I must tell. So now we know what are the signals that are present. Signals present in introns, signal present in exons, signal present in between introns and exons. All of these things are important and the most important of all is the branch point because this is the start point. So let me tell you, this is the start point of any kind of splicing. So, this is very much important. So, now let us look at the mechanism of self splicing. So, we won't, uh, the, the splicing event will just go on in this mRNA, right? So, let us try to look at the mechanism. So, for this again, we will be having, uh, say, this intron. So, simply I am drawing this structure. So, I am drawing here, say, this is uh, intron. Sorry, this is an exon, this is another exon, and they are linked with each other via an intron. And I am, do, I am just uh, drawing the introns a single line. Okay, so this red colored single line is intron, and these blue colored regions are intron 1 and intron 2. Okay, now in between. <laughs> Somewhere middle uh, in this introns, we are having the branch point where we are having the residue A, right? Now this A or this adenine. So what we what we mean by this adenine? It is not simple the base. It is a triphosphate, right? It's a diphosphate link. So these phosphates are linked to form the phosphodiester backbone, and it is having the ribose sugar attached to this base, right? Because we are talking about RNAs. Remember. So what, what is the actual structure? The structure, remember, if you don't remember, I'm just drawing it for you. So we are having, say, this is the structure. This is the ribose structure. Here, phosphate will attach. Here, the next phosphate will attach. And here, the base is attached. So this is the structure of a ribonucle uh, 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 ribonucleotide, right? And for the ribonucleotide, will be having hydroxyl at the 2 prime of the ribose sugar. So this is the first prime, it two, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4 and this is the 5. 
okay now for the record you must know that this two prime region is very important to distinguish between the ribonucleotide and deoxyribonucleotide because in ribonucleotide we are having two prime hydroxyl group here but in case of dna we won't have two prime hydroxyl this oxygen is deleted in dna so that's why we call them deleted oxygen or deoxy ribonucleotide. Okay, so this concept is very much required for this to understand. So for this A, suppose this base here is adenine. So suppose this base is adenine here. So the, if this base is adenine, it is making a ribonucleotide complex. Now this complex must have this ribose sugar on it. It must have the 2 prime hydroxyl on it. So the 2 prime hydroxyl of this ribonucleotide will be there. So this is the 2 prime hydroxyl. Now this 2 prime hydroxyl that is present in the branch point initiates the splicing reaction because this hydroxyl can be a nucleophile. Yes, we know that this hydroxyls can act like nucleophiles. So this hydrogen will be deleted. So this oxygen will uh, be the nucleophile. Now it can attack the phosphodiester linkage. This is a very important step. Now here this nucleophile, this hydroxyl, the two prime. So remember, whenever we're talking about two prime hydroxyl, it is not the hydroxyl that is present in the three prime end. So let me draw this first. Very important. This is 5 prime and this is 3 prime. There is also hydroxyl here. This is phosphate here. But we are not talking about hydroxyls at the 3 prime and 5 prime here. We are talking about the hydroxyl at 2 prime. That means the hydroxyl is from the ribose sugar. Okay. Now, this hydroxyl group acts as nucleophile. Now, it will attack. It will attack this region of AGG. So this is the region. This red arrow sh is showing the exact region where the adenine 2 prime hydroxyl is attacking. So it will attack in turn this region. So here this will attack this region. As a result of this nucleophilic attack. So this is nucleophilic attack. This nucleophilic attack results in the production of so as as it attacks this region so this is simply AGGU this is the attack site now as a result of this attack this exon 1 is cleaved out this exon 1 is cleaved out in turn this 2 prime hydroxyl will bind with this 5 prime of the intron so what it will look like it will look like this Intron 1 is out and here it is and say this is another intron, this is intron 2, okay and this is the branch point where all of this, sorry, all of this splicing started. So this forms structure like that okay so hydro nucleophile attacks here it will cleave intron 1 out now as intron 1 is out it is having its 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl now it is a hydroxyl here 3 prime but the 5 prime end is joined with the branch site okay so the 5 prime end is joined with the branch site now a future step of the reaction. So let me erase this. Next step of the reaction. So let us consider it here. This, this intron 1 is having the hydroxyl, 3 prime hydroxyl. Remember? Now this 3 prime hydroxyl can also act as, as a nucleophile, right? Because hydroxyl can act. So it can act as a nucleophile. Now it can go and attack this branch site or this C prime splicing site. So what will be the case? The case will be something like this. So let me draw this structure again. So here it is and here is intron 1, this is intron 2 
and say this is the previous case we are having this branch site and we are having hydroxyl 3 prime this is a 5 prime phosphate so this is the situation now after the nucleophilic attack by the 2 prime hydroxyl from the branch site it will develop two structures one is the intron one which is just cleaved out another one is a complex structure with intron 2 uh, sorry sorry uh, I have made a mistake from the beginning so this middle reg region is intron these two regions are exons very sorry about that so these are simply the concept is same so these are the exons exon 1 and exon 2 so as this 2 prime hydroxyl from the branch side attacks here it will cleave exon 1 out it will cleave exon 1 out and it leaves exon 2 Okay, and so after the first cleavage, what we got, we got one exon, so exon one cleaved out, and rest of the part is intron with exon two. So it's a complex of intron exon. So one exon is out, exon two is complex with intron. Now this exon one, which was previously made free, its three prime hydroxyl is now ready to attack the three prime splicing site of this intron exon 2 complex now it will attack here and as it attacks here it will cleave this introns out so this is an intron it will result in cleaving of this intron out and as a result this exon 1 will bind will bind with exon 2 so the last step is This is exon 1, this is exon 2, and the rest of the part, this is the intron. We just cut out. Okay, so now let us discuss about this picture in very much detail. So, after the first nucleophilic attack from the branch point, which is present in introns, it's it produces exon 1 and intron exon 2 complex. Now, this intron is much like a structure of a lariat right so this complex as the intron is looking like a lariat it is called exon lariat complex or exon 2 lariat complex now when at the second phase of the reaction the exon 1 will attack the ex lariat exon 2 complex and it will generate this lariat of which is made of with totally introns and it is free and rest of the part E1 and E2 are joined. So the exons are joined with each other. Okay. So these are the steps of self mediated splicing. Why it is called self? Remember, in this process, this mRNA, or we better call this pre mRNA, can cut itself out, join the exons together, and form the mature mRNA. It is called mature mRNA. Mature mRNA means this mRNA is ready to coat proteins. That's why they are called mature mRNAs. And what happens to the intron lariat? It can be degraded. Most of the time it is degraded. Sometimes the process can be reversed but this is not the issue. It is degraded simply. And this product, this byproduct must be removed to keep this reaction going forward okay as now I've covered the mechanism of self splicing it's a time to think it thermodynamically whether this process is favorable in the forward direction or not so if we draw the arrows of this reaction these are the steps so this is the first then second the third and the fourth okay now I hope you can visualize whole uh, process but now it is important that whether it is favorable or not okay so what happens in this case is simply breaking of phosphodiester bond and forming of phosphodiester bond 
In very first step, when the 2 prime hydroxyl of branch point adenine attacks uh, the 5 prime signal of splicing, it simply cleaves the phosphodiester bond between this AG and GU. So one phosphodiester bond net cleavage. So cleavage net one phosphodiester bond. In the very second step, so as it is cleaving out, then what happens? This intron, 5 prime of the intron, start to round out and attach with the hydroxyl of branch point, branch point adenine, to form a lariat structure. Formation of this lariat structure needs the formation of phosphodiester bond between the 5 prime of the intron and the hydroxyl of the branch point adenine. So it's a formation of phosphodiester bond. So we broke one, we form one. So net charge or net uh, phosphodiester bond formation or breakdown is zero. Now let's come to the last two processes. In the second phase of the reaction, the exon 1, which is having the hydroxyl acting as a nucleophile, attacks the lariat exon 2 complex, cleaves the, the phosphodiester bond between the lariat and exon 2. So here again, we are cleaving one phosphodiester bond. The second step, what happens? This exon 1 and exon 2 start to join with each other, and this joining again via the phosphodiester bond. So, we are forming one phosphodiester bond. So, what is the take home message? We are breaking two phosphodiester bonds and we are also making two phosphodiester bonds. So, the net bond breaking and making is zero. So, this reaction is uh, so according to our visual visualization about the reaction about the process we can tell we can say that this process is fairly uh, reversible right because the net energy to put is zero so for this kind of reaction we can say that it is fairly reversible so what it means? So if we are having exons and lariates, what it can do is that it can put intron lariates in between two exons and it can produce a pre-mRNA. Right? If it is reversible, then this thing must happen. But the answer is no. It does not happen. Why it doesn't happen? The answer lies here, where the products are formed. If we think it as a chemical reaction, then for any kind of chemical reaction, we are having the uh, equation of the substrate plus substrate is converted into products. Now for this, we must have access to some catalysts or may not, but the process is substrate to products. Now here, these products are formed. So the products are exons and introns, intron lariates and exon complexes. Now, in this case, what we are doing, we are removing the products. Now we know in any chemical reaction, if there is a way of rapid product removal, that reaction must have kept in the forward direction. Remember this and print this uh, in your uh, notebook. That if in any kind of chemical reaction, we get a way of removing the products. If the products are removed very faster, these type of reactions have a tendency to occur in the forward direction. Here, the same mechanism is utilized for cells to do that. So, what the cells are doing, whenever they are producing the mature RNAs, these mRNAs no longer present inside the nucleus. Now, this is a very important concept. I haven't talked it before. I may have, but I haven't. The concept of this mRNA splicing, mRNA editing, mRNA modification, whatever we are talking about. All of these events are happening inside the nucleus of a cell. All of these things are happening inside the nucleus. Once the mRNA is released into the cytoplasm, it must be totally edited, totally formatted. It, is, it must, read, must be ready to produce proteins, to generate proteins, to code proteins rather. Okay, so this is a very important concept. So, as we are producing mature mRNAs. They are quickly removed into the cytoplasm. So here, product is removed. Product removal happens in the compartment, which is the nucleus. Second thing, whenever we are producing these intron lariats, these intron lariats are taken up 
by the cytoplasmic mechanism of protein degradation and they are degraded. Sometimes these introns can also be taken up to produce snow RNAs. What are snow RNAs? We are going to see in the later videos. So again in this case product removal. So these product removal steps are helping this whole chemical equilibrium to move in the forward direction. So that's why it won't become reversible. Okay. Now let us come to this question. We, we are talking that this whole process is self-splicing. So the splicing events that are happening here is mediated by this intron and exon pre-mRNA sequence. So it is this, the, the uh, signals for the splicing is present inside the introns and exons. Mostly it is present in the introns. So we cannot uh, forget the importance of introns. Okay, so we no longer call it the junk DNA nowadays. Anyways, so here we can see if it is a chemical reaction, it is a chemical reaction indeed, it is a catalyzed. So if we think this introns as a catalyzed, uh, as, a, as a catalyst for the reaction, is it right to consider or not? Now, now let us talk about the functionality or the properties of catalyst. The two fine property of catalysts are is that catalysts are helping the reaction to occur really faster. This is the point. Second thing, in case of any kind of catalysis, the catalyst must not be changed. So catalyst it will uh, involve in the catalysis, it will modify the substrates into products, but at the end of the reaction, this catalyst must be able to be recycled. So they are recyclable, right? So the catalyst we are talking about must be recoverable. But for this type of reaction, what we can see is that this, th this intron mediated things, it is acting like a catalyst because it is lowering down the activation energy for the process. So first criteria is fulfilled. But what happens to the next? What we can see after the process, the pre-mRNA, which is a self-catalyst, if we consider this pre-mRNA as a catalyst, after the reaction, it is modified and we cannot recover. Remember, we cannot recover our catalyst in this case. We cannot recover. As a result of unable uh, to recover this thing, the second criteria is not fulfilled. So, we cannot call this process, this self-splicing process, as self-catalysis. So, this is not a type of catalysis. This is in turn, we can call it a self-splicing. Okay. Now, in any kind of splicing, the most important concept is to bring the three points of splicing close to each other. What are these three points? Remember, I have talked before. The 5' prime splicing signal, the 3' prime splicing signal, and the branch point. For any type of splicing, whether it is self-splicing or spliceosome mediated splicing. Okay, so we must take these three points together very close, in very close proximity for a longer period of time for the reaction to occur properly. Remember, in case of enzyme uh, properties, close proximity, longer period of time provides advantage to enzymes to catalyze reactions pretty faster. So, in any kind of splicing, it is the goal to take these three branch, three points closer to each other. Now there lies a problem because this mRNA is negatively charged. The backbone of mRNA is made up with phosphates and phosphates are negatively charged. So they are negatively charged. So what will happen? They start to repel each other. So this repulsion can cause problem for bringing these three points closer to each other. So how cell can solve the problem? They can use proteins small proteins. Those proteins can interact with these RNAs and can form complexes, can shield the backbone of the mRNA. So we need lot of proteins, small lot of proteins to hold on to the different regions, different signals and then bring them, bring these three points closer to each other that, uh, so that this reaction can happen. So we are going to see the same exact machinery of using proteins 
and ribose RNA protein complexes to facilitate the RNA splicing in the process called spliceosome mediated RNA splicing. Now, this mRNA, this pre mRNA, along with this R ribonucleoproteins, it forms a complex, it produces a loop like structure, and this loop like structure with this protein complexes, protein RNA complexes, are called spliceosome. Now, in the future video, we will be talking about the spliceosome and how spliceosome helps to cleave the DNA and to join the exons only and leave introns out. Okay. So, I hope this is helping you to understand the intron-mediated splicing or the self-splicing. Thank you.